Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Very warm welcome to the first talk of uh, 2024. I'm uh, Harry Sherrod, and on behalf of the talks team, it's great to see a full house. Um, there are some seats further forward, but I guess you guys at the back, you're, uh, you're comfortable back there. So I'm sure you all enjoyed watching that um, extremely um, historically accurate um, <laughs> extract from the... Uh, Great Escape movie, complete with 1950s British triumph. I'm sure most of you know, know that little uh, movie quirk. Um, but here this evening to tell us um, what really happened, give a big hand please for Joanna Bristol Watkins. So, um, hello and welcome to the Brooklyn's Museum. Some of you are members, of course, and uh, interesting You've got the Concorde on display here because um, my father, Alec Bristow, was actually a pilot instructor for BOAC and BA, and he taught people VC-10s and 707s, those pilots he taught, and a lot of them went on to become Concorde pilots, so nice to be here. Okay. So this is a picture of Dad, as you probably guessed, and this is his story. By the way, um, he was also one of the people involved in the long march at the end of the war, where they were evacuated from the camps. And I do have a few slides relating to that at the end, if there's time. So we'll wait and see how the time goes. So um, my father's name, full name was Alec Norman Bristow. And would you believe that he was born on the 20th of October 1916 in what is now Epsom Workhouse? So he was born um, to, well, his mother, who he didn't grow up with. And he was basically adopted by his aunt and uncle and their seven children, and uh, they grew up in Guildford. This is a picture of the, some of the boys, and there's my dad wearing a white shirt. From the stories I've heard, I don't think it stayed white very long. Um, so from there, he went in 1938. He was employed as um, chemist in charge at Holes and Davidore in Brighton. And um, this is a picture of them there. He's the one on the right here. In fact, I think it says on the next bit. Yes, it does. So that was what he did before the war. And he started flying in 1938. So this is him in front of an um, Hawker Hart. And in fact, that's the sort of costumes that you had to wear <laughs> then. It's a little bit alien to us now, is it not? Uh, to imagine that you had to dress up in all those clothes. Although we might have been glad of them today, eh? That nice, thick, warm... Eskimo suits. So on the 25th of February 1939, he enlisted in the RAF Volunteer Reserves, and he was teamed up with somebody called Bernard Marshall, who he remained with throughout the war and, in fact, in the prison camp as well. He got married to my mum on the 8th of June 1941, and her name was Joan Helen Hazeldean. And he joined Bomber Command on the 7th of June 1941, First of all, in 107 Squadron, which was Blenheims. And he did a tour of duty in the Blenheims. That's what a Blenheim looks like. I'm sure most of you know <laughs> in an audience like this. They did mostly low-level attacks on aerodromes and shipping. And each sortie carried, believe it or not, a 50% risk that you weren't going to return. So we have to get our heads around that, and it gives you some idea of exactly the sort of lives they led and the adrenaline rush that went through them every time that they had to take part in a mission. And another little anecdote here, or a little, little um, statistic for you if you're interested, that believe it or not, the average lifespan of a World War II pilot was three to six weeks. That's all. Of course, the longer you lived, the longer you survived, the longer you were likely to survive because you'd got a lot more experience. Um, but that was the average. Shocking, isn't it? And on his Blenheim attacks, he did actually have a narrow escape in Brest, um, unfortunate name of town there, <laughs> um, where his plane was hit by heavy flak and they got some bad damage, but he did make it back to Cornwall. Now, what happened with a tour of duty, which was usually about 40 40 missions, if you like, 40 sorties, as they were called, or 42, or 32, actually, in this case. Um, you were then given a little bit of a break, and you were generally made to do some training, some pilot training. Now, I've read a lot about this time, and I've read a lot of biographies and autobiographies from people that were um, in the same sort of um, squadrons. 
And, um, and I can tell you that a lot of them, as soon as they got posted to do some training, they usually were really keen to get back into action, which is hard for us to believe, but that's how it was, that they, they kind of saw it as a bit lily-livered, if you like, to be doing something else. But they really needed it because it was such an adrenaline boost the whole time that they were out doing missions that they needed the rest. They needed actually some time off. So um, on the 18th of August, 42, he was posted to RAF Bovington, and that was for training US personnel. As I said, that's what happened between sorties normally. And the next thing he did was he joined 105 Mosquito Squadron on the 8th of September, 1942. And they were situated at Swanton Morley in Norfolk. And yet again, he was teamed up with Bernard Marshall. Now, they did have a third crew member when they were with the Blenheims, but they, they lost him <laughs> when they moved to Mosquitoes. I'm sure a lot of you here know quite a lot about the Mosquito, do you? Yeah? So, um, now, interestingly, we didn't know when my father was alive what a, an honour it was to be a Mosquito pilot. And that sounds crazy, but we didn't realise quite how advanced the plane was and all the magnificent things about it. Because if you look at the date here, 8th of September 1942, when he joined 105 Squadron, you'll find out in a couple of minutes, it was only about two months later that he was shot down. So he wasn't a Mosquito pilot for very long in his career, but it was what he defined himself as. So if you ever asked him what he did during the war, he would always say, I was a Mosquito pilot, which is a bit of a clue that there was something special about being a Mosquito pilot but we didn't know when he was alive. <laughs> so the de Havilland Mosquito, um, he flew the B-4 bombers. They had no defence against attack. So they conducted low-level daylight high-precision attacks with fighter speed. That was the only protection they had, was the sheer speed with which they could fly. And they were faster than any other plane around at the time. The Messerschmitts and the, and the Fokker Wolves were similar speed, but at low, low heights, then the Mosquito was significantly faster. Some of you will know this already, but the bizarre thing is it was made entirely of wood. Um, the fuselage was held together with cold water glue, so it was often referred to as the wooden wonder. And the bomber variant, the one that my dad flew, could fly um, up to 400 miles an hour, which was actually significantly faster than anything else on the market at the time. And the wooden construction had lots of really amazing benefits because metal was in very scarce supply by then. And this plane could be built by cabinet makers or piano makers or coach builders, which gave it a significant advantage. And famously, even Goring was really, really jealous. This is a little quote from um, Her Herman Goring. It makes me furious when I see the mosquito. I turn green and yellow with envy. The British, who can afford aluminium better than we can, knock together a beautiful wooden aircraft that every piano factory over there is building, and they give it a speed which they have now increased yet again. And in fact, the quote goes on to say that it makes them feel like nincompoops. <laughs> yes. And he goes on to say that after the war, he's going to buy himself an English radio because at least it might work. <laughs> and the irony is we all buy German ones now. <laughs> so um, Pilot Officer Roland, who was another member of uh, 105 Squadron, he described the Mosquito as having the top half camouflaged with earth brown and tree green, and the bottom was sky blue. Why do you think that was? Why would they need those colours? Absolutely, yes. So if you were looking from underneath, it melded with the sky. And if you looked from above, if you were in a fighter plane, it melded, it was camouflaged against the, the land. So most pictures you see of the mosquito doesn't seem to show that, so I was quite excited to find that, find that out. Okay, so this is um, a mosquito image here. Now, the, the interesting thing is, and why, as I said, my father was obviously very proud of what he did, was that he was on the first active operation for the de Havilland Mosquitoes with the B-4 bombers. So on the 25th of September, 1942, their mission was to bomb the Oslo Gestapo headquarters, 
which was timed to humiliate a Nazi rally headed by the Norwegian politician Quisling. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's how I usually say it. Now, when they were given their um, instructions for this mission, they were told that there would be cloud cover and there would be no enemy fighters anywhere nearby to cause them any trouble. Famous last words, eh? The Gestapo headquarters operation was a round trip of 1,100 miles, a flying time of four and three-quarter hours, and it was the longest mission to date that had been flown by a mosquito. So that was the first challenge. Now, this involved hours of deep concentration, and they had to cross the North Sea at heights of only 50 to 100 feet so that they would avoid any radar, and that meant that they had to use dead reckoning for their navigation. The mosquito, I'll come back to what that is in a moment. The mosquitoes were armed with four 500 pound bombs, and that had an 11 second delayed action fuse. So, in a low level attack, it was quite possible that you might actually be damaged by your own bomb or one of the others in that same formation, because 10 seconds doesn't give you very long, 11 seconds doesn't give you very long to get away. Um, now, despite the briefing, it was absolutely clear sky with no cloud whatsoever, and they relied on cloud for them to actually fly in the cloud to give that element of surprise. But the biggest shock was that Quisling had organized a fly past of two Fokker Wolf um, 190s. And of course, as soon as they realized that these mosquitoes, there were four in the squadron that were on this attack, as soon as they realized what was happening, they scrambled the Fokker Wolves and they were on their tails straight away, and sadly, one of the, the crew of four was, was lost. My father, Alec, obviously returned, and he was awarded a DFC on the 20th of October, 1942, for his part in that mission. So that was his first, if you like, mission on the mosquitoes. And such was the exciting news of the mosquito that the raid was featured in two consecutive editions of the Times. So it was a big deal. Now, um, on the 7th of November, 1942, he wrote in his POW diary that he had to um, ditch, this is what he put, the plane hit heavily by flak during a 50-foot attack on a 10,000-ton blockade runner in the Gironde Valley at 1,600 hours. We ditched near the shore by Royan, northwest of Bordeaux, at 1610, under the cover of several gun batteries of the Atlantic Wall. There were no injuries. His prisoner of war number was 816, and he was a flight lieutenant at the time of capture. And this image is actually taken from a website um, called aircrewremembered.com, and you can see that same picture that they've used of my dad, actually, and that's an image of where they landed, where they had to crash land near the Gironde Valley. Now, they landed in the water, and, of course, being wood the plane floated for a while, and they got out and they sat on the wing. <laughs> and they looked at the shore, and they could see the Gestapo there, and they thought, why aren't the Gestapo coming out to get us? Well, they obviously knew they couldn't stay there forever, so sooner or later, they had to wade ashore. And when they did, they found out that they'd landed in a minefield, <laughs> which is why the Gestapo hadn't come to get them. <laughs> OK, so another lucky day, or a second lucky event on the same day. Now, when I was first putting this talk together a few years ago, um, I was looking for information about the mosquito. And I came across an unexpected photograph, which I'll tell you more about in a moment. So the air crew were given instructions in invasion techniques. Evasion techniques, I should say. Before each operation, they were issued with an escape aid box containing some local currency, a small hacksaw, a compass, a silk escape map, and some concentrated food that might last some 48 hours to seven days. Now, yes, so when I was talking to the Pathfinder people, they, I was talking to them um, about, in fact, I didn't think they would have heard of my dad, but apparently they had heard of him, A, because he was on the Gestapo raid, and B, because he was also involved in the building of um, bird-proof windscreens because of an incident that happened with him as well, where his, his um, windscreen was smashed by birds. And in fact, he couldn't see anything either. The, the, the flesh of the birds had got into his eyes. And they lost radio control, and they actually had to land the plane 
without any radio control, without any windscreen, and without my dad being able to see anything. And remember that your number two is not a pilot. He was only a nav navigator. So the navigator had to talk my dad down. I don't know how they landed. Apparently on the seventh landing, they made a perfect landing. So he is quite well known. Seventh attempt, I should say. Um, so he is quite well known within the mosquito um, buff land, if you like. Anyway, when I was talking to the Pathfinder Trust, they said, do you know what? We've got a picture of your dad's aircraft. <laughs> so this is the actual aircraft. Can you believe it? And um, we can tell, because obviously it's got the number on it, so we know that it's definitely the right one. It was obviously taken by a German, and on the back is written, Englischer Flieger bei uns abgeschossen, which translates to English pilot shot down by us. <laughs> so there you go. He didn't, even, he didn't know that that picture existed, so that was an exciting find. So what happened when you were shot down? Obviously, once the Gestapo picked you up, you were taken to be interrogated. And the RAF, and anyone, any pilots, if you like, were always taken to, particularly um, officers, I should say, were taken to a place called Dulagluft. There were several different Dulaglufts, but he was taken to Oberrösel. And so he spent, you can see, quite a long time in Dulagluft, because the 11th of November to the 5th of December is about three weeks, isn't it? And they probably would have been interrogated most days. And um, he didn't talk about this very much when he was alive, but subsequently, when I was starting to research this talk, I did a bit of research online. Believe it or not, I put in my dad's name and the Gestapo raid, and it all came up on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing things you can find on Wikipedia. Anyway, at the bottom of that, believe it or not, there were some podcasts in the um, Imperial War Museum by dad's navigator, Bernard Marshall. And in that, he talks about what happened when they were shot down. Now, um, my dad had told me, I've never been able to verify if it's true, but I don't know why he would make it up, but he told me that he was actually on his way to play a game of hockey when he was called into this mission. So he was wearing his hockey blues when he was shot down, and he and Bernard Marshall were about to leave the camp for a weekend away. Presumably, they were playing the, the, the game somewhere else. And um, when they were being interrogated, according to this Imperial War Museum podcast, the um, interrogator said, and you were very unlucky, weren't you, because you were about to go on leave. So they don't know how that was found out. They obviously had some pretty good moles on the ground, so it's all a bit of a mystery. But I know they did use lots of techniques to try and get one, to say something that the, the, they could then present to the other, because you never interrogated together. It was always, um, you know, solitary confinement, etc. So it could have been that one of them said, but I doubt it very much, because they were all drilled to only give their name, rank, and serial number. So all very strange. Anyway, I don't think it was a very nice experience being at Oberusel. So Dulla Gluft was a very horrible-looking building. Look at it. Um, so it was opened in December 1939. It was built on an old government poultry farm. Uh, barracks were used to house the POWs awaiting transfer to other camps. Now, why do you think it says POW on the roof there? Has anybody got any ideas about that? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, that, so that the British didn't bomb it, well, and the Allies, yeah? So, good idea, eh? Um, now, Durag Luft is abbreviated from Durchgangsschlager der Luftwaffe, and you can see in the red there how that's got shortened to Durag Luft. From April 1940, the Stonehouse Park was an interrogation centre for new POWs, and RAF airmen were all con commissioned or non-commissioned officers, and according to the Geneva Convention of 1929, that ensured that they got better treatment if they were captured, and they couldn't ever be used as a workforce. So that's quite a key thing to bear in mind. It's another picture of De La Gluft. And that particular building is the cooler, um, which is the solitary cells area where they would be held while they were being interrogated. Looks horrible, doesn't it? Looks like a prison, I must say. Okay, so now we move on to where he went to next, which was Stalagluft itself. Stalagluft 3, we traditionally use the three digits there. <laughs> um, it, it was in Sagan then, it's now spelt with a Z, Z-A-G-A-N, and it's now in Poland, but obviously it was in Germany then. And when he first went there, he was in East Camp, the um, 
from the 7th of December 1942 to the 30th of March 1943. Now, I need to show you some things here because this is quite important. Um, these green areas were not there until quite late on in the war. So we've got this section here. East Camp is over here. And you've got Central. There's a Central Camp and there's also a... Just trying to... Yeah, this, this bit here, it's called German Lager, not the drink. <laughs> Presumably that's where all the German officers were. So we've got East Camp and Central Camp there. This is North Camp. North Camp wasn't built when he first went there, so he was over in the East Camp to start with. East Camp was actually the site of the Wooden Horse Escape, if any of you have heard of that. A successful escape where three men actually made it all back to Britain. I haven't got time to talk about that today. <laughs> Dad wasn't involved with that, as far as we know. It happened after he'd moved to North Camp anyway. So um, North Camp, he was moved to on the 30th of March, 1943. And you'll see that he was there until the 28th of January, which is when the Long March started. And this is North Camp here, as I said, in the middle here, in the light green. Yeah? And the, the, the little hut there, marked up in red, was his hut down by the, the um, theatre. Now, all of the um, Stalag, Stalag Luft literally meant air, so it was, Luft means air, so they were basically, all the pilots were housed in the various different Stalag Lufts, but Stalag Luft 3 or Stalag Luft Dry, as the German name for 3 is, is obviously very well known because of its connection with the Great Escape, but all of the Stalags were manned by the Luftwaffe guards, and that's really important because most of the other prison camps were manned by the Gestapo, who were very cruel and unpleasant. Um, whereas the Luftwaffe guards, because they were, the Luftwaffe was basically the name for the German Air Force, so they were Air Force officers themselves, and there actually was quite a degree of respect amongst the Luftwaffe guards, particularly with the officers in the camps. Now, a little bit of a joke here, that the, um, <laughs> they, they called them goons, which they claimed, this is what the, the, the um, allies in the camp called the officers, which they claimed stood for German officers or non-commissioned officers. But of course, it was a little joke that they could call them goons because it was insulting. Um, the fact that it wasn't the Gestapo was a big benefit. Now, they also had another really big benefit, that their colonel um, in charge, Commandant Oberst, um, it would be the name of the, the guy in charge, he was called Friedrich von Lindeiner Wildau. And he was an extremely, how can I describe him, honourable man. And that comes across in the film, I think you'll, you'll agree. Though, who's seen the film here? Most of you? A few, few hundred times, maybe? <laughs> yeah, so that, they do that well, that part of it. Now, the other thing you might not realise is the size and scale of the camp. And, I mean, obviously, we're talking here about, by the end of the war, 10,000 people, because these two camps weren't, weren't built at this time. But each of these areas housed about two, well, not that bit, because that was a German bit, but all, the, all of the camp bits housed about 2,000 POWs. There's quite, quite a lot, quite a lot of, of POWs in there. And um, by the end of it, we had 59 acres, or five miles of perimeter fence. Now, the south and west camps, marked with the darker green, weren't opened until um, 1944. So what was it like in the camp? What was camp life like? Well, the first thing to say is that the recommended intake for a healthy, adult, inactive man is about 2,150 calories. And what they were getting was 1,600 calories. So a significant shortfall. But you know what? This talk is not anti-German. My, my dad wasn't even anti-German after the war. He was only anti-Nazi. And a lot of the Germans weren't Nazis, remember? So, so the thing is that the rations of the everyday people in Germany may not have been great either. But they were able to supplement their shortfall of calories by um, Red Cross parcels, and that made a big difference to them. Now, in all of the camps, the officers received internal camp currency called Lagerfeld, Lagergeld, sorry. And there's some pictures. This is from my dad's diary. So this is actual Lagergeld here. It's probably pretty rare. Um, and in Stalaglov 3, all lager gelt was pulled. What that means is that in most of the camps, the officers got the lager gelt, but the non-commissioned officers didn't. But at Stalaglov, they just got them all in and they spread them around the camp so everybody was allowed to benefit. 
And this would be used, this lager gelt would be used as something called fudaco, so you could do internal bartering. And if you got sent a jumper, say, from home, you didn't want a jumper, you'd rather have some cigarettes or whatever, <laughs> then you could swap it, and that would be called fudaco. This is a typical daily menu. German bread with jam, coffee or tea. For breakfast, lunch might be potato soup, coffee or tea. Supper would be potatoes and maybe meat roll or German bread, coffee or tea. An evening snack would be toast, coffee or tea. Of course, this would not be our understanding of coffee. This would probably be something like acorn coffee or something, ersatz, as you used to say. But you, you can see that there was a, a substantial amount of bread <laughs> on the menu, quite a lot of potato. And in fact, once Dad got home after the war, he wasn't very partial to um, parsnips, swedes, or um, any of those root veg, really. So I think they must have had a lot of those as well. Okay, so um, the layout is interesting because you had 15 rooms would be um, in each, sorry, if you go back to the original camp, do you remember I said that the red, the red one was his actual hut? So I'm describing a hut here, okay? So the hut would have 15 rooms in it, exclusively used for living and sleeping quarters, and that would contain five two-foot bunks. So basically 10 people sharing a room. So this is, this is Dad with some of his um, roommates, and actually most of them are Canadian. I'll come back to that later. This is one of the biggest inaccuracies about the film, is that there actually weren't any Americans involved in the escape. There were in the lead-up to the escape, and we'll talk about that in due course, but the actual escape itself didn't involve any Americans because they'd all been moved into the new camps. So they were all, um, all the people who were Americans in the film were actually Canadians. So you can imagine what nationality or what nation might have been a little bit angry about that. At the back, there were two bedrooms with single beds for senior ranked officers. And there'd be a small room with two facing toilets and three larger rooms, one for cooking, a communal washroom for laundry and makeshift showers, washing, cooking pots and dishes, and a recreational communal room. This is a picture I found online of a communal room, and I'm pretty sure that that's Dad. It certainly looks a lot like him, and he did, he did have a pipe. <laughs> but that's complete luck, I tell you. Now, in 1943, they had more and more and more prisoners were rolling up to the camp, and so they had to introduce triple bunks. And I don't think that I would like to have been on the top bunk, to be honest. Or maybe I wouldn't like to have been on the bottom bunk, because it wouldn't be much fun to have two blokes fall on top of you if they collapsed, especially when you find out what they were doing to the bunks later, taking all the bed things out to build the tunnel. So they were pretty um, ramshackle by the end of it, I'm sure. Now, one of the books I've read, one of the many books, features this picture, and rather alarmingly, it's labelled The Four Rogues. Left to right, Gwyn Martin, Alec, Joe Noble, and a guy called Richie, who I know nothing about, apart from the fact that he features in this picture. Now, Joe Noble, who is often referred to as Red, in my dad's opinion, was the inspiration for Steve McQueen. Now, other people say differently, and I think the truth is that it wasn't based on any one particular character, but certainly Joe Noble showed a lot of the same traits. He was always, apparently, playing handball, you know, for, well, he was a keen um, sportsman. There was no motorbike race, as we know, anyway, so that was... There was nothing, <laughs> that was completely made up by Steve McQueen, who was a motorbike fan. Um, but he was also uh, very often in the cooler, apparently, red. And uh, he, he did some very, well, you're here. He, he did some pretty um, daring things over time. Okay. So um, these are other camp activities that you may not realize were going on. Would you believe that they had organized facilities for athletics? Volleyball, softball, boxing, touch football, table tennis, and fencing. And you can imagine that some of these things, which involved a lot of shouting and noise from the audiences and stuff, were incredibly useful when it came to covering up the other sort of noises that might be going on underneath the ground. 
So they were very much um, approved of. This is an actual certificate from Dad's diary, which claims that, that Dad had accepted the loafers challenge <laughs> and that he shattered the world record, or the camp record, I should say, um, for walking around the camp fastest. And it was, um, according to this, 20 circuits took 2 hours, 15 minutes, 29 seconds, with the fastest circuit being his 20th, his last one. He was obviously rushing towards the finish line, which he did in 5 minutes and 44 seconds. So um, it said that he broke the record by 10 minutes. And the timekeepers you'll see down there are J.A. McCaig, Gwyn Martin, and um, Joe Noble, two of the rogues. <laughs> now, when, again, when I was reading the various autobiographies, in fact, it was Gwyn, um, Gwyn Martin's one where the, the picture featured. And he also had a whole chapter on some rather obscure things that they did to kind of keep their um, spirits up, I guess. And this is obviously one of those typical things. But anyway, in his book, in Gwyn's book, he talks about the fact that my dad bet that he could walk around the camp faster backwards than the oldest person in the camp. And he lost the bet. Yes. He did make it, but he fell over quite a few times, and the older person did get back first. <laughs> okay, now, um, there was a substantial library in the camp as well, which was hut 110, 110, and there were educational facilities, which, would you believe, not only included offering um, crafts, but also you could actually study for a degree in there. And that's because they obviously had various university dons that were prisoners as well. Now, another amazing thing is that they built a fully operational theatre, offering West End quality productions, and lots of the biographies explain that the Germans used to like coming to those shows as well. And they, you know, they did full-on pantos with them dressed up as girls and all sorts. So, I mean, it was just crazy. And in fact, the, guy, the guys who wrote Carry On were in the camp, and they started there. And a lot of the people who ended up in the Carry On series were in the camp as well. The most well-known probably being, um, is it Butterworth? I'm trying to think of this. Peter Butterworth. Yes, he was, in, he was in the camp. So, yeah, several of them were. They had um, a radio station. Well, now, this, this is interesting because K-R-G-Y, it's, it's obviously short for Kriegi, which is the German word for a prisoner of war because Krieg is, is war. And um, so they had a, a, a radio station called Kriegi, which, of course, would not have been known to the Germans that they had the radio station. Um, they published two newspapers four times a week. And lots of work went on in the meantime with the engineers and stuff, the radio engineers, breaking the code and listening to the BBC radio and everything and finding out what was going on in the UK. But that would have been completely secret, whereas this is more known. And um, they had, because they knew that they would want to be doing escape attempts, they had a very sophisticated prisoner verification system to ensure that there wasn't any infiltration by German spies. So if you couldn't be um, identified by at least two other people in the camp who you know, might say, well, I've served with this person, so I know he's definitely who he says he is, then basically you weren't told anything for months. You were just completely kept in the dark just to make sure that no secrets got out. Now, they also had a duty pilot rotor, and this was to monitor what the goons were up to. So, um, and the ferrets, by the way, were the ones who looked underneath, <laughs> underneath the camp. So, um, this was so good, this, this system that they had set up, that the commandant used to check against when the guard said they'd knocked off what it said on their duty rotor. And quite often, the guards claimed to have left later than they did, and they were in trouble. So this was a very, very accurate system. So let's just go back to the camp here. So this is a very big close-up of North Camp itself, and there's the red area here of Dad's hut. Now, 
So he was in there, as we know, from March 43 to January 45, and there were about 2,000 other POWs in that North Camp area. Now, something else it implies in the film is that it was, a, it was an officer's duty to escape, and apparently that's a complete myth. Um, some American um, operations do have that idea, but it wasn't the case during World War II at all, certainly not for the British. But I do think it was really applauded because it was seen as a good distraction. Um, it kept their hopes up, if you like, that they might get back. It was a good diversion. And, of course, if they got out and, and all the resources of the, of the Germans were spent looking for them, then that was helping, <laughs> helping the war effort. Um, and so um, it, was, it was definitely encouraged, if you like. And I think that low-level escape efforts were pretty tolerated by the guards. Do you remember in the film when they're, like, poking the hay, the hay lorry? Do you remember <laughs> in the beginning? So they, there was, it was quite light-hearted. I'm sure life was terrible in this camp, so I don't want to play it down. But they, they, I think they kind of were quite, in a way... Um, respectful of them trying? Does that make sense? So, the reason that they did that was because, actually, Stalobov III was considered escape-proof. Now, some, some of us here might remember the film Colditz. Do you remember Colditz? And to me, it was always, oh, Colditz was escape-proof, right? So, it was only when I started studying for this that I realised it wasn't the only escape-proof place. Stalobov III was definitely considered escape-proof in its own right, and this is why. This is a model from the film, by the way. So, these are the reasons. First of all, it was a secure, considered, escape-proof, remote location surrounded by thick pine forests. So, it was going to be difficult to get anywhere useful, right? The huts were all built on stilts, six centimetres tall. So, that's about two foot, yeah? So... That's not going to be easy, is it, to tunnel out of that? The soil was bright yellow and sandy quite soon under the surface. So that gave two reasons for it being difficult. Firstly, if you had any sand on you, if there was any bright yellow soil on you or on, on the grounds, they knew that you were trying to escape. And also, sand is prone to collapsing. Okay? It's very, very difficult to dispose of, of yellow soil on a grey topsoil. And as I've said, it's, it's prone to collapsing as well. The other thing is that because, probably because of the wooden horse escape from East Camp, where three people actually got back to the UK, and that was a tunnel. Basically, they tunnelled out from under a, one of these wooden horse gym things. It's not like the Trojan horse. It wasn't looking like a horse, but it was, <laughs> it was a gym horse, right? And they would take it out to the same part of the grounds every day. And while they were jumping over it, somebody who was hidden inside the horse would, would be going down and carrying on with the tunnel, which they covered up when they'd finished. They knocked on the, on the horse when they'd had enough, and the people would be carrying them back, the, the guy who'd done the digging and the sand for the day. And, you know, that worked. Three men got out. They actually tunneled out beyond the, the, um, the fencing. So po probably because of that... They thought, right, we're going to put seismograph microphones <laughs> under the soil all the way around the perimeter, which will be listening for tunnelling attempts. So these were lots of reasons why Stalag Love 3 was considered to be escape-proof. However, they hadn't banked on Roger Bushell. Now, Roger Bushell is the real name of Big X. Big X came to Stalag Luft in spring 1943, and his idea was, let's build three tunnels, Tom, Dick, and Harry. In fact, they built a fourth one later. We'll come to that if there's time. And they won't discover them all, and they'll never think that we would have built three tunnels, so that's a great plan, right? So that's what they did. And they built two-foot square tunnels supported by wooden slats to protect, um, prevent collapse. They had to be because of the sand, right? The sand would collapse, so they had to have internal shoring. And in fact, that was one of the things that we know our dad did was the, um, was the shoring of the tunnels. And they had wooden pulleys. There's a picture of one. This is what it looked like in there. This is a picture that's drawn by Leigh Kenyon, who was actually in the camp with them, and he drew them at the time. And that's how it looked. 
looks like a coal trolley, doesn't it? But it was very clever. And um, they would transport the, the digger plus his tools and extract the sand. Now, why, why do you think they built two-foot tunnels? Why were they two-foot square? Because it's pretty tight for a full-grown man, isn't it? Across the shoulders. Absolutely, yes, because they were two-foot beds, right? So they were using all the bed boards. Hence my comment that I wouldn't like to have been in the bottom bunk. Because by the time they were actually escaping, there probably weren't very many boards left in a lot of those bunks. Right, so the tunnelling was managed by a Canadian guy called Wally Floody, and he was an ex-miner. And this was so that they could avoid the seismographs. They had to drop the shaft 30 feet to avoid the sensors. That's quite some task, to be building a 30-foot drop through sand, right, without being um, detected. The digging all took place between the morning appell, so that's the roll call, which took place at 9.30 in the morning, and the evening appell at 5.30, so they couldn't be missing. No one could be missing when it was appell, so all the work had to go on between those times. And after that, it would be curfew. You wouldn't be allowed to be moving around in, in, the, in the hut. So it, was, it could only take place during the day between those hours. Now, many of them worked naked, unlike the picture. <laughs> and uh, the tunnels progressed seven to eight feet a day. That's pretty substantial, isn't it? Seven to eight feet a day. Now, why would they have been naked, do you think? Any thoughts? Yes, no yellow sand on their clothes. Anything else? Hot, yeah? Anything else? They were stripped in their clothes. Yes, good point. And the clothes might be more likely to catch the sand as well and make the sand collapse. So that's why they work naked, allegedly. <laughs> okay, and um, the other amazing thing was that they soon got to the point where they needed air down there, so they put in ventilation pipes. And how they did that was they got hold of, there were some um, milk tins called Klim. They put all the milk, empty milk tins together and created um, pipes from that. And later, they put in electric lighting. And they did that partly by going into the wall, because they all had lighting in their huts, but they would go into the walls and take out all the slack wire from the walls and cut it off and put it all together. So not only was it lit, but obviously the Germans were paying for the lighting, for the electricity, which was rather rather nice. Um, and in fact, you remember I said that Joe, um, Joe Noble, who was called Red, he did some daring things. He actually stole some electric cable when they had some um, German electricians come in as well. He stole some off the van. And that really helped with the electric lighting in the, in the um, tunnel as well. So tunnel management, well, Tom, Dick and Harry were dug simultaneously. There were 600 men of all nationalities involved. At this point, they were British, Canadian and US Airmen predominantly. This is a picture of the actual one that, that was successful in the end. So you'll see here, um, can you see, there's like a contraption here, can you see? Because basically, the entrance was underneath a stove, because they thought they're never going to find it there. And so the stove was too hot for them to lift, so they had to have this sort of contraption to help them lift, lift it off whenever they were doing some digging. Big S was the American um, who managed the stooges, so he was monitoring the, the stooges and the ferrets with the German guards who would look underneath the huts to see if there was any signs of tunnelling, and they had dogs as well. They didn't have actual ferrets, they were the names of the German guards, but they did have actual dogs. And the sand was disposed of by penguins, so that was the nickname for the prisoners, because basically they had a whole load of, like, long johns. This is done very well in the film, actually. They had long johns underneath their trousers, which would be full of sand, and they'd sort of go around like this, trying to release a tiny bit of sand and kicking it in so that it wasn't visible. And later, when they, um, when they started building the theatre, they thought, well, why don't we put a whole load of sand under the steeped seats? perfect place, because obviously loads of space. So that got used later as well. And Z was the name of the organisation that forged the escape documents, collected food, supervised maps and clothing, and they created things like compasses from melted razor blades and Bakelite records. And of course, going back to the, the creation of the escape documents, then what could be better than a theatre when they're being given an allowance to produce clothes for the shows 
to give them the, the clothes for their escape so that they wouldn't be wearing their uniforms. Okay, now, I'm sure most of you probably have realised, but this is also, because I do sometimes this talk to younger audiences as well. So this is where Stalag Luft is situated now, so it's in Poland now, it was in Germany. And um, I just show this to demonstrate to people that you might think, well, it can't be that difficult to get out, right? <laughs> but, but all of this blue area was all occupied by the Germans, so to try and get back to the UK was pretty difficult. I mean, you really had to get to here, even that's, in fact, that's Norway anyway, and well, that's Norway. You had to get to Sweden, really, because Sweden was independent, or you had to get to Switzerland. So it was quite, it was pretty difficult. Um, you really had to have a lot of um, wits about you, and also you needed equipment and the right, the right um, documents and stuff to help you get there. So back to the, the diagram again to just show you how this works. So this is how Tom, Dick, and Harry work. So Tom... Remember, this wasn't here, right? This has is, this is not been built at this point. So Tom was one of the tunnels, a nice edge hut that they started off at, and that was going to build out here. This is all woods at this point. Now, Dick, they thought, do you know what? They aren't going to look a little bit further in. Okay, They're going to think if we're going to tunnel, we're going to tunnel from an edge one. So let's go from one a little bit further in. So they started Dick here, and this went all the way. It would have gone out that way as well. Okay. Now, Harry was from this area, this hut here, and it was going, this is wire, this is a barbed wire here and here, so it was going under the barbed wire, and this area here was solitary confinement and a hospital and something else, so it was going to go under all of that, and that was going to come out in the woods over here. So Tom, Dick, and Harry. That was the plan. These are more pictures by Lake Kenyon. Right, so in June 1943, it was announced that they were going to build this area here. They suddenly say they're going to build these areas, starting with this one. And that they announce that all the US airmen are going to be moved to there. Now, once they start building this, what's going to happen to Tom and Dick? They're going to come out in another bit of the camp, aren't they? Hopeless. So they thought, crikey, we better get our skates on and get everybody out before it goes too far, and while the Americans are still in the camp. So that was the plan at the time, was to move things forward. So Tom, the one located in hut 123, was almost finished, and they ramped it up to give them a chance of escaping while the Americans were still there. Um, and before the clearing work happened too much and was going to mean they'd have to go another 50 yards once that had been built. Unfortunately, at this point the German guards discovered Tom, and it was destroyed with an explosive charge. And they were really surprised at the sophistication of this tunnel. So it gave them a big shock. And because of that, they thought, we'll have to lay low for a while, because the, the Germans are really looking now, and they're, they're suspicious. And also, there wasn't any point in carrying on with Dick, because that was going to be thwarted by the new plans as well. So they decided to rest for a while and then go hammer and tongs on Harry. Okay, but they had to wait for um, everything to calm down a bit, and it went from quite a delay, you can see there, from June 1943 to January 1944, nothing much happened. This is a, a picture from Dad's diary of his plan of the, of the actual um, tunnel. Now, the tunnel of Harry was going to be 320 feet long, and as I said, extending past two sets of barbed wire and under the cooler. It started in hut 104, concealed under a stove, and it featured two railway interchanges, <laughs> and they were called <laughs> Piccadilly and Leicester Square. <laughs> and by no March 1944, they dug beneath the perimeter, and they were now ready for escape. It's one more diagram here, a professional one, if you like. So you can see it goes down the 30 feet. Here's the interchange here. You've got somebody working with the bellows to blow air in. You've got the area where they stored the sand, and this is the railway line. This is uh, Piccadilly and Leicester Square. <laughs> and this is where they were supposed to come out in the woods here. And you've got, unfortunately, a goon tower right next to it, which wasn't great planning, but that was how it was. Okay. 
So, we're ready to escape now. 220 men were chosen to escape, including our dad. So, they, they drew lots, and you were given a number, okay? The first 100 were known as serial offenders, and they were allocated um, to be the most likely to actually get back to the UK or back to, back, back to um, homeland, if you like. So... That would mean that they would probably be German speakers, or at least foreign speakers, so they could pretend to be a, a foreign worker if they were caught. And they were prioritised by being given better forged documents, better maps, better civilian clothes, etc. So if you were a serial offender, you had a better chance of getting back because you had the better gear given to you. Now, remember, I didn't make up the names, OK? So the second 200 were known as the hard asses, <laughs> And that included Alec. We reckon he was about number 151. But without properly forged documents, they would have had to avoid public transport, they would have to lay low by day, and they would have to travel by night in freezing weather, because we're talking about the winter here. So, it's the 24th of March, 1944. You may realise that that means it's the 80th anniversary in two months' time. And it was chosen because it was a moonless night and the camp's most disliked and efficient ferret, who was nicknamed Rubberneck, was away on leave. So those were two reasons why they decided to go ahead. So at 10pm, Flight Lieutenant Johnny Bull cleared the last few inches of soil. But he was met with a shock. Things hadn't gone to plan. After 15 months of preparation, the tunnel was ready, but it was 30 foot <coughs> short of the woods, coming up alarmingly close to that sentry box. And it was snowing. Now, that doesn't happen in the film, but in reality it was. And that wasn't good news, because they were going to leave footprints, yeah? Not good at all. Um, so as the first escaper went into the trolley at 22.30, it was snowing. The shortfall meant they had to have a system for telling each other when it was safe to come out. So they had to set up a communication thing. And worse still, there was a blinking British air raid. Would you believe it? And that meant the Germans switched off the power. So guess what? Tunnel was plunged into darkness. So all of these were really problematic. The pace of the escape was meant to be 12, an, well, sorry, became um, 12 an hour, but they were planning one a minute. So that's a very big difference, 12 an hour from one a minute. So at this point, the hard asses, the second hundred, were told, stay in your hut, because curfew is approaching and you won't get a chance to escape. That's why we know Dad was one of the second hundred, because he told us that he knew quite early on that he wasn't going to be one of the, those making the escape, well, quite early on on the day, I should say. Why do you think they carried on with that date? When they got to the end and it was, it was short, why do you think they didn't just stop and decide to give it a bit longer? Any thoughts? Very good, yes. The main thing was all the travel documents were showing that day and date. So they would have all gone to waste and they'd have had to make them all again. The other reason, would it probably would have been quite difficult having tunnelled up for 30 feet through sand to then come back down and go a little bit further. So there were plenty of reasons, but probably at this point they would have been sensible to not go ahead, but too late, eh? So by dawn, 76 men had made it into the trees and a 77th was poised, ready to go. Um, this is how they set up, and that's quite well done in the film. So one of the guys laid in the woods here, and he had a piece of rope. The people um, down in the tunnel, the rope would go down into the tunnel, and then he'd give it one tug for come and two tugs for wait, or whatever. So a little code going. Now, unfortunately, at this point, um, a patrolling sentry left his beat and went very near, and the person in the woods sent the signal for stay put, but unfortunately, the person at the other end misread it to mean go. So he practically ran into the sentry, unfortunately. Um, plus the guard noticed the tracks in the snow and he fired a warning shot and blew his whistle. Several outside the tunnel made a run for it, at least one surrendered. And the guard apprehended the next POW in the tunnel and the rest retreated. 
Um, they went back along, you can imagine they were going up backwards. Um, they had blocked the tunnel entrance, they were burning all the documents, they were trying to eat all the rations that they'd saved as well. Um, they could hear shots going on, they didn't know what was happening. The ferrets couldn't actually find the tunnel entrance, and so eventually, German ferret, Ch Charlie Pilz, obviously slightly less hated than Rubberneck, he was <laughs> entered from the far end and he worked his way backwards, came to under the stove, couldn't get out, and for a while they ignored him, but again they realised that they weren't going to get away with it, so they had to let him in eventually. Now, in the meantime, that stay on the escape, the re with them getting so much less out, or so many fewer than they planned, their one a minute went down to the 12 an hour, then many of the escapees didn't make the train that they had their ticket for, or they, um, they, had, to, um, they had to just stay in the area, if you like. So a lot of them were caught in the immediate area of Sargon. So what was the aftermath? Well, considering the escape-proof nature of the camp, you can imagine how humiliated Hitler felt. And... Um, it really does remain the greatest escape of both World War I and II in terms of numbers. Because Hitler was so furious, he firstly, apparently, ordered that all of the escapees should be shot. And that was in direct contravention of the Geneva Convention that we mentioned earlier. But it's believed that Himmler negotiated the number down to 50. And because the Gestapo were not allowed to shoot them, it was against the Geneva Convention, as we've said, their reports, because they were allowed to shoot them if they were resisting recapture, if they were trying to run away. So most of the reports were forged to say the prisoners, whilst relieving themselves, bolted for freedom and were shot whilst trying to escape. And to be honest, they weren't shot in a group. I think they're shot in a group in the film, aren't they? Or some of them are, but they were mostly shot in ones and twos, sadly. Um, the commandant, von Lindheiner Wildau, who I already said was a very honourable man, he was absolutely horrified but he was held partly responsible by the Gestapo for not having done a good enough job of policing the area. So he was arrested and court-martialed, and um, the, the prisoners and the Luftwaffe guards were all horrified. Of the 77 that got out, 50 were executed as per Hitler's decision, 19 were returned to Stalag of three, six were sent to Sachsenhausen, two to Kolditz, and only three made it back to England, and that was two Norwegians and a Dutchman. So no British people actually got back. But obviously, as we've said before, they, they would have been considered the um, likely escapers. They spoke other languages, Dutch and, and um, Norwegian, uh, both of which were occupied areas, and so they could get away with, if they were caught, they could probably have claimed that they were um, foreign workers. And, uh, and they, they actually um, all got back, as I said, so at least some people did. But um, post-war, the Gestapo killings were all tried as war crimes. Back in the camp, well, immediately afterwards, those remaining in the camp were made to stand naked outside in the snow for two hours for a pell. So that was some kind of punishment, for sure. There was an atmosphere of shock and disbelief in the camp, and in his diary, Alec wrote a list of those put to death with details of the hometown, date of capture, age, profession, and he put a little asterisk next to some of the ones that had come in the same purge as him, which would have been the same... Stalag Luft III camp intake in December 42. The new commandant was stricter, Gestapo investigators were everywhere and prisoners and guards were all edgy and later the POWs were permitted to build a memorial for the 50 who died. The Foreign Secretary, Sir Anthony Eden, announced the news to the House of Commons on the 19th of May 1944, so a couple of months later. And eventually work began on the fourth tunnel, George, so they still hadn't learnt their lesson. They were going to have another go, and that was going to go east out of the theatre, but in fact it was never used. So, final um, look here, just to show you that George would have come out here. Um, I would have thought that wasn't very helpful, but <laughs> that's, that's what all the, uh, in, the information I read says. So this was the one that actually went out, but it was too short of the woods in the end. So, are you ready to listen to this amazing camp inventory after the event? This is what was missing. 4,000 bedboards. <laughs> 1,317 beading battens. 1,212 bed bolsters. 52 20-man tables. How could you not miss that? 
10 single tables, 34 chairs, 76 benches, and they were all used to shore the tunnels. 3,424 towels, 635 mattresses, 192 bed covers, 161 pillowcases were all used to muffle the sounds. 1,290 knives, 30 shovels, 478 spoons, 582 forks, 246 watering cans, and 14,000 powdered milk cans, because they were used for the ventilation air thing, um, were used as digging tools and ventilation equipment. And 600 feet of rope, also stolen by Red, apparently. 69 lamps, 1,000 foot of electric cable, which was thanks to Red as well, had been taken and hooked up to the camp's main supply. So, I mean, that is pretty amazing, isn't it? <coughs> and it gives you some idea of the complete scale. Now, um, can I just ask them, what, how are we doing for time? Because I haven't actually got a watch on. Oh, right. OK. Is there, do you want to just very quickly hear about the, the, just a couple of introductory things on the... Because this is the end of that part. Have I got time? Sure. OK. So... Um, well, looking into his diary now, on the 12th of January 1945, the Russians began their great offensive. They were only 200 miles from Sargon and 300 miles from Berlin, and rumours were rife in the camp about a move. Um, now, in his diary, he says, we found it difficult to visualise, but we got to work making backpacks from kit bags. And at the end of January 1945, the Russian forces were less than 12 miles away, and the sound of battle was constant. Um, 27th of January, Hitler ordered evacuation of the camps, and the POWs were told to prepare to march that night, perhaps within the hour. So it was a real panic. Pandemonium was widespread. We ate as much food as possible, hurriedly packed our bags. And for my own part, the previous day, I'd washed a set of heavy underwear and six pairs of woolen socks. The socks were almost dry, but I had to discard the former. So over 10,000 men marched out through the gates of Stalaglov III that night. The conditions were extreme, with sub-zero temperatures and a thick covering of snow, and it was said to be one of the coldest winters in living memory. The, stretch, um, the column stretched five kilometres, and the, um, the men marched hour after hour, relieved only by ten-minute halts. And the POWs were not the only ones heading away from the Russian advance, because um, the German people who lived in the eastern regions were all evacuating as well. They anticipated that the Red Army reprisals for atrocities committed in their homeland by the Fuhrer would be pretty extreme, so they were very scared for their lives as well. Families with their entire belongings packed on a cart struggled alongside those with minimal possessions left to carry. And this is an actual picture of, um, of the march. There's very few available. Um, and this is actually a week later now, because I'm, I'm obviously I do another talk about the, the, the walk, but... Having moved on a week, having left Sargon, they'd, they'd been walking for a week. They'd walked 96 kilometres, and he was wearing two grey coats and, you know, carrying all his belongings, all the food and everything else, so it was pretty extreme. And they'd walked all the way to Stremberg in three days of marching. And he said many had fallen sick by the wayside with pneumonia, sorry, pneumonia, pleurisy, frostbite, and old injuries reasserting themselves. And then they caught the train from there to Bremen, on to um, various other places, ending up at Tarmstadt, and then they were taken to Marlag, Milag, Nord, Tarmstadt, which was a special military um, encampment for the Navy, actually, but they were all moved into that. Later, they were told to march again. On the, um, in April, they had to do a second trek all the way up to Lübeck, so it was very, very difficult, and they ended up at Trent Horse. They actually made it back to the UK on the 7th of May, 1945, after two and a half years, to the day, because he was shot down 7th November, 1940, um, 1942. And he was around 10 stone at the time, he's six foot one. And he was demobbed in um, December 1945, returned to the dairy industry working for Cowan Gate in Guildford. And that's a picture of him arriving back in the UK. Um, he rejoined the RAF in 1947 and retired 10 years later as a squadron leader. He then became um, a BOAC pilot and pilot senior instructor with BOAC, then BA, until 1980. If any of you come from this area and have lived here a long time, you might remember Alec Bristow Travel, which opened in 1963. We're in Chertsey, and we had shops in Chertsey, Walton-on-Thames, Woking, two in Woking, in fact, and one in Esher. And interestingly, 
Um, these are two of the shops, actually. They were all themed, so uh, this one was like a black and white 60s type theme. Um, one of them, the Chertsey one, had, it's like a, um, a Greek villa, and um, the Isha one was uh, like a hunting lodge, so they were all very original for their time. And interestingly, he had a poster and cinema advertising campaign which said the great escape begins at Alec Bristow Travel, <laughs> which, of course, was, um, was a little play on words for him. And he ran those travel agencies until he died in 1990. So I'll just finish with this poem that he wrote um, called Lines Written in the Sunshine, which he wrote on the 25th of March, 1945. Sing on, sweet lark. Delight me with your music. Your freedom holds the essence of my dreams. High o'er my captive soul, you preach of beauty, winging it back to England, shady streams and other glories sacrificed for duty. Well, thank you very much, Joanna. That was a very professionally presented and, I have to say, very moving, especially towards the end of, of talk. Absolutely marvellous. One, one of the best talks we've had. I'm sure everybody agrees. Um, we can have a, a short our q and um, I think we did have a, a sort of an advanced question put in with this gentleman over here. Do you, do you want to ask that question? Put my glasses on now so I can see you. <laughs> thank you, Joanna. Brilliant, thank informative you. presentation. Just on a personal note, um, I have a picture at home, a photograph above my desk of two smiling 18-year-olds. One of them was my father, and his best friend at school was Michael Casey. Now, Michael Casey was one of the 50. Oh, he was... Gosh. Sorry. Hmm? Sorry to hear that. Uh, he was originally of Irish stock, born in Allahabad. His parents were, or father was head of the police inspectorate in Uttar Pradesh. And he came to England, and in 1936, he left the uh, um, Stonyhurst for the school he was at, and went to the RAF Cranwell, and became a very good pilot. Now, he was an extremely tall man, uh, and the Irish rugby selectors were interested in, he was the boxer and cricketer. And, uh, he was sent to France in 1939 uh, on his bow fighter, where he was shot down in October 39, crash landed, he was rumbled by a Messerschmitt 109, and was sent to Stalag Luft 1, where he met Bushel. And he was one of the bad lads, and subsequently was sent to Stalag Luft 3, uh, where he was on the escape committee. And he was head of... Uh, hiding all the documents in the camp, and he's also a treasurer. And he got out, he was number 72. Oh, wow. And he was unlucky because if he'd only been 78, yes, he, would he would have, have been have captured out. and yeah. sent straight back into the camp. He only got 40 miles. Uh, his documents are not good enough. And then he was interrogated by the Gestapo, uh, sharp. Hearing, I think his name was, was the head of Gestapo, I think in Breslau, uh, who interviewed a lot of the, the chaps. And he was one of a small group who was then sent out one day and basically shot in the back of the head. Uh, my father, who was in the Navy at the time, found out and was very, very upset. Needless to say, at the end of the war, the good news was the RAF knew about all of this and did go after these bastards and found most of them, and a good number of them were shot. They were, yes. Yeah. And, uh, but Sharpearing was behind the Eastern Bloc, and subsequently he disappeared. So, thank you. There Do you we mind are. if I just ask if there's any questions? Because that That's was very, it. very interesting, but thank you. Thank you for that. And I mean, the. Um, it's interesting you raised the point about the, as we say, they were tried as war criminals, but in fact a lot of the, the prisoners, a lot of the POWs stood up for, um, for their camp commandant and he was let off because they said that he wasn't one of the, one of the bad guys. But thank you, yes, 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 very sad. Thank you, horrible story, but so interesting. Any, uh, any other any questions? questions at all? Um, yeah, got, got one down here. Hi, just a quick question. If there was a 60 centimetre gap under the uh, huts, 
Was the uh, entrance under the uh, stove in any way boxed in, or did people have to do a sort of leap of faith to get... Uh, how was that? How was yeah, that? they would have had to jump down. I can only surmise. Nobody's actually explained that anywhere, but I assume that underneath the, the stove was just a space to the ground because they would have had to dig the tunnel underneath, wouldn't they? And, um, you know, I said that they had dogs as well who would come and sniff around, so they had to have it hidden enough for it to not be picked up. But, yeah, I guess, I guess they would have had to have... Probably part of the team that would have been doing the stooge control <laughs> would have been also keeping an eye on whether it was safe for them to jump down. Yeah, good, well observed. Thank you. Any other questions? Just a comment rather than a question. There's a documentary, I think it's on Channel 4 or Channel 5, where they went back to the camp. The stoves were on concrete, so they're on concrete pillars. So they actually oh. dug through the concrete pillar to get out. Gosh. Yes, well, they, I mean, they were very... All you can say is, I think the thing is, because they were <coughs> RAF officers and they, were, they had nothing else to do but plan this, but they were very in, in, intuitive and in, they used a lot of initiative. And like you say, it was pretty, it's pretty impressive to hear that. I'm actually going over. I've never been to Stalagluft yet, but I'm going over there in March because I've been invited to do the talk for the 80th anniversary by the RAF, so I'm very excited about that. Was your father reticent to talk about yes. his experience? Yes, and I wish I'd pushed him more. Um, I think my sister, one of my sisters is here today, and, and we wish we'd asked him more, don't we? But, I mean, funnily enough, he, he died in 1990, quite a long time ago, and I'd been to see, just him and I actually, we'd been to see the Memphis Bell a week before he died, which was about, a, I think it was a 14 or 12 man American um, Air Force plane. And um, he actually talked a bit about it in the film, about the differences between that and the mosquito. I learnt quite a bit that night. If only I'd known he was only going to live another week. Um, but even if he'd lived longer, I probably wouldn't have shown much interest. <laughs> That's the irony, isn't it? Shown a lot more interest in it since he's gone, sadly. Thank you. A very brief question. Yes. I was intrigued to see photographs in sight. I mean, were, were there cameras there? You, you had that one picture where there was the six of them. Did yes, I don't know. How, well, I mean, I've read in various places that they they needed photograph, they needed cameras to build the um, fake IDs and everything. So, it, and it's kind of mentioned a bit in the film, but obviously you can't always take that as, as gospel fact. But it seems as if some of the guards, some of the Luftwaffe guards, were actually anti-Nazi. So, and some of them had been bribed in a way that they were going to be in trouble if they didn't cooperate. So they were able to get certain things. Um, and uh, cameras apparently were amongst them, but uh, you can imagine they were pretty few and far between. So the pictures are rare. Yeah, but we have got a few of the drawings by Lay Kenyon, as I said, and they're pretty useful too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Another round of applause, please, for our <laughs>